Okay. Um, our next presentation, um, as, as this group knows, if you've been coming to these symposia over the last decade, you'll know that we often try to hear the voice of the patient in, in, these, in, these, uh, in these presentations so that we actually have a, have a richer understanding of what the work that we're doing means uh, at a societal level. And I'm really happy to, uh, to be able to introduce to you uh, Sharon Bulger, who is going to tell us a story about her son, Cameron. Uh, Cameron was diagnosed at the age of six with a rare type of brain cancer. And he underwent a whole lot of medical treatment that, uh, that, that Sharon is going to tell us all about. He was in and out of care for two and a half years. And um, he was also himself interested in helping to promote blood donation and stem cell donation. And so, uh, so Sharon's kindly agreed to come tell us, tell us his story. So Sharon, I, I believe we've made you a co-host so that you can actually show your own slides. If you click the little green button, share screen at the bottom, you, it'll, it'll, you'll be able to do that. Great, I'm just looking to pull that up. Give me two seconds. No problem. My apologies. So because I just need to open my Zoom up in a different window because it's trying to share it with the same one. I have your slides, but I can't make the video run. So I can I could get that far anyway, if you want oh. me to do that. There we go. Okay, great. Excellent. Perfect, we can see your slides. Great, that's good news. Well, thank you and thanks so much for having me here today. Um, I'm looking forward to, to sharing our family's story with you. And uh, I was able just to catch the last little bit of that uh, presentation that was just being made, which sounds very interesting. Um, certainly the medical aspects of, of this journey and, and we, the learning about blood products and, and uh, how they're made and how they're collected and all those pieces were something that was very interesting to both my son and I uh, as we delved into this brand new world. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that today and certainly leave some time at the end uh, for some questions. Uh, so as um, our story uh, isn't unfortunately one with a happy ending for you now, um, it's not one that can be sort of neatly wrapped up and packaged with a bow. Um, the hero in our story, uh, Cameron, uh, didn't get to see his 10th birthday, but he did get a couple of extra years of memories and fun. And a lot of that was attributed um, to the availability uh, of blood products. Oops, well, I skipped a slide. Um, so my oldest son was an adventurous, kind, and faith-filled, generous, and humorous little man. Uh, he loved roller coasters, bike riding, playing hockey, and everything and anything to do with water activities. Uh, but most of all, Cameron loved his people. Cameron looked forward to family gatherings and holidays and birthdays, and uh, he always had a homemade card with some sweet words to share. His little brother, Zachariah, followed in his footsteps, and uh, we always described him as a little ball of joy. Um, that child always had a smile on his face. On January 18th of 2018, Cameron was six years old and I was in a work meeting at the student rec building actually at the UBC campus when I got a call from Cameron's school. He was having focal seizures and 911 was called. Before that day, Cameron had never had any uh, health issues at all. The drive from UBC to the hospital was excruciating and filled with the feeling that today might be one of those days that forever changed the trajectory of our lives. When we met him at Surrey Memorial Hospital, he was vacant and unresponsive, and a CT scan determined that there was a mass in his right frontal lobe. We were taken by ambulance that day to BC Children's Hospital. After a whirlwind of weeks and uh, days in the hospital, uh, many ER visits and scans, Cameron went in for brain surgery to remove the mass. I remember feeling like this was the worst of the days if we could just get through this eight hour surgery that we would be okay. Never did we think that the pathology results of this lesion would reveal a grade four malignant central nervous system embryonal tumor, uh, not otherwise specified, and given him only a 40% chance of surviving five years. 
we are a family who has always chosen to make lemonades out of lemons, and uh, that's exactly what we decided to do. We were given the option to either go home and live out a few months of his life with him, or choose the standard of care, which uh, is radiation followed by chemotherapy. It's a treatment plan that we knew would buy us some time, uh, but it certainly doesn't produce any chance of life-saving results with this type of cancer. And our last option was to choose an extensive and brutal trial protocol that would be harsh, but it wasn't not proven to work at this point. So we knew right away that we wanted to fight and Cameron did too, and so that's what we chose to do. The trial was called Head Start 4. Um, so it had gone through four iterations at this point um, with new findings. The trial was randomized, some patients receiving a single cycle consolidation of chemotherapy, while others received a dose intensive tandem consolidation. By luck of the draw, Cameron landed on the tandem path. Three rounds of extensive induction chemotherapy, which was meant to prime his body, followed by three more rounds of what they called mega chemotherapy um, with three stem cell rescues. I know many of you, if I understand correctly, are researchers, so I wanted to throw in here, if you ever had the chance to name something medically, I urge you to consider the mother of the child that may need that treatment or drug. The mega chemotherapy effectively put his bone marrow to sleep and halted the production of white blood cells. His immune system was non-existent and his body would begin to shut down after each cycle. He would stay that way for a couple of days uh, while infections and other horrors took over. And then we would use his stem cells to reboot his system and literally rescue him. Cameron and I lived at BC Children's Hospital for six months with little contact with the outside world as he needed protecting. The last leg of the Head Start 4 trial was the proton radiation and I'll touch on that in a few minutes. We learned very quickly that blood literally is a lifeline. Without available blood products, this treatment trial would not have been possible as it would have killed him. Blood allowed us to fight. I'll never forget the first bag of blood that Cameron received. He was so interested in how somebody's blood ended up in that bag. When he learned that someone had, chose, uh, had chosen to be stuck by a needle to be able to give their blood for somebody like him so that he could choose to fight, he was in awe. He would thank God for the person who donated that blood each and every time he received some. Blood donors and the people that made blood donation possible were his heroes. Very quickly, I became to uh, be able to identify and predict when he would need blood. The signs were clear and consistent, and I would make bets with the nurses as to when the doctors would need to order it. I was only wrong once in over 50 transfusions. Within minutes to hours of receiving blood products, my boy always came back to me more alert, energetic, and better cognitive abilities. I hated that he needed blood, but I was very grateful that it was available to him. Because Cameron's body was able to produce his own stem cells, he didn't need donor cells. It was partway through his second cycle of chemotherapy that they harvested his stem cells at BC Children's. BC Children's has the most amazing hematology blood disorder nurse that oversees the stem cell harvesting. She burst into our room the morning of the stem cell harvest, throwing her hands in the air and announcing that it was stem cell day. Cameron and I both loved the medical side of his care and were very interested to see how this process worked. I've included a few pictures, but I'm sure these are not new for you. Um, they told us uh, that they needed to test Cameron's blood for a marker called CD34, and they needed a minimum cell count of 0 0.020 cells per mil to have a successful harvest. They got 0 0.800 cells per mil, which was certainly a good sign. I won't lie, I was a little bit concerned um, that seeing that he'd already been so impacted by chemotherapy that he wouldn't have a good cell count. What was initially predicted to be a five to six hour harvest and was over and done with, with two, in two and a half hours, they only needed to collect 15,000 cells per kilo of his body weight and they collected 69,000 per kilo. An agent called DSMO was added to his cells to keep them alive while frozen because the agent needed time to work. They froze his stem cells at one degree per minute until they reached minus 70 degrees and then put them in a cryogenic freezer at a temperature of uh, negative 180. Before we began the stem cell portion of his treatment, we were moved from a regular oncology room to a transplant room. The room consisted of a sliding glass door that would lead into an entrance room where we would wash and wipe everything, including ourselves, before heading into the room um, that would become our living quarters for the next 30 or so days for each cycle. On stem cell transplant days, there was a lot of fuss that went into making sure that he and everyone on the transplant team were ready. A medley of pre-medications needed to be given, Tylenol, morphine, Benadryl, hydrocortisone, and he was hyperhydrated. Five minutes before transplant, the frozen stem cells were brought up and put in a water bath that was just above normal body temperature. 
apparently the DSMO that keeps the cells safe while frozen um, will kill the cells at room temperature. So while they are still slightly frozen, they would be rushed into his room and the process would begin. The transplant itself, after all of that, only took about seven minutes. It was rather anticlimactic given the prep and number of people in the room each time. The smell is obviously what I remember most. Uh, the DSMO comes with quite the olfactory punch. I made sure to have lavender essential oils on hand so that Cameron could smell that. Uh, with an overly nauseous chemo patient, a smell like that can smell, spell disaster. Thankfully, once transplanted, he could no longer smell the odor of the DSMO, uh, but I could as it seemed to ooze from every one of his pores in his breath for several days. Grafting of his stem cells was about a nine to 15 day process each time. It felt very slow as Cameron was often extremely ill on those days. Neutropenia brings on all sorts of complications and infections and most of those resulted in the need for blood. During these times, Cameron had a transfusion of either hemoglobin or platelets every one to two days. The chemotherapy comes with many side effects. Cameron experienced mucositis, many skin issues, bowel complications, the need for a feeding tube, and at times for TPM, the feed that went through his central line. He also had grade four hearing loss that caused him to lose his high frequency sounds and he required hearing aids to be able to hear. After the six months at BC Children's, uh, we were finally discharged and we headed to Seattle for proton radiation. These are some pictures of, of that experience. Proton radiation is a specialized form of radiation that precisely targets tumors with the goal of minimizing radiation to healthy tissues. So Cameron received 18 gray of radiation through his entire brain and spine and 56 gray to his tumor bed. We stayed at Ronald McDonald House in Seattle for about seven weeks in order for him to receive those 30 doses. During that time, we were also being taken care of by Seattle Children's um, and got to experience a little bit of the differences between our Canadian blood system and the American blood system as he did require blood several times through that process as well. There were many lemon-like days, but we chose to make the most of each one and had quite a lot of fun wherever we could. Cameron looked up back on those days in 2018 with fondness and he didn't remember the sickness as much. He certainly didn't remember the days where he was so sick that I was worried that the treatment would actually take him. He only remembered the fun we had, the amazing nurses and doctors on the ward and the child life teams. In early 2019, Cameron was declared in remission. We began to put our lives back together. It was here that the passion born from that first bag of blood uh, was given space to flourish. Cameron launched into fundraising efforts for pediatric cancer research and into raising awareness for the need for blood and blood donations, as well as stem cells. We visited the Oak Street Donation Center to say thank you to donors and do a little interview. We joined forces with the Hockey Gives Blood, one of Cameron's favorite sports, and Cameron and his buddy talked to dozens of potential donors on the concourse of Rogers Arena. It was amazing how people would walk by the adults with the same information, but would stop and give their full attention to Cameron so he could tell them that he was alive because of blood donations and to please consider donating. We had the honor also of presenting awards at one of the CBS donor recognition events. And Cameron was so thrilled that he gave out all of the awards as he didn't want to leave the stage. He literally hugged each recipient as they came across to get their award. This was a special day also as he was able to give his granddad an award for suppressing 100 donations. This next slide that I'm going to flip to has a little video of Cameron at the media event that I'm hoping is going to work for you today. He wasn't prepped to speak. He was prepped to hang out with me, but he just jumped right in and this is what he said. Cancer. It's really hard. I couldn't have better way to help people supporting me. And thank you for everyone who donated blood. Please come and donate blood here. Oh. He loved that. He loved watching that on TV later, and he loved the ability to just to be able to interact in those moments. Sadly, Cameron's remission was short-lived. And by the summer of 2019, we knew something wasn't right. An MRI revealed that a new tumor had grown rapidly. And you can see that I've included some of his MRI uh, imaging here. Um, you can see the black hole in the upper corner that's where the initial resection took place. And then you can see the white that's growing into the middle. Um, and that's the second tumor that developed at this time. A biopsy confirmed that it was the same cancer and that it was located now in the caudate nucleus right at the head in an inoperable location. 
we were told now that his cancer was terminal and there was no curative treatment options available. The thought of losing our boy was incomprehensible and, uh, and we wanted to fight and so did he, so we did. We enrolled in another phase one drug trial. Again, the only option on the table that hadn't yet been proven not to work. We also fought hard to get him into the CAR T cell trials that were starting in the USA. In the meantime, we set out to continue to live our best life daily and ensure that no time was wasted. We had an amazing summer of vacations and adventures and we moved up his Make-A-Wish trip to early September so he would be well enough to enjoy Disney World Florida and give kids the world village. Fun was the focus and we had a ton of it. Cameron continued to receive blood as needed and it was a gift that has always made him feel better and prepped him for our next adventure. Cameron continued to decline, but thankfully not as fast as our medical team predicted. Uh, proton radiation in the fall of 2019 helped him regain some loss of mobility that suddenly took his left side function over a span of about 48 hours one weekend. And that regaining of some of that gave us a lot of hope. We initially didn't think he would see Christmas, and so we were super thrilled to be able to celebrate his ninth birthday with him on March 4th of 2020. Unfortunately, the phase one CAR T cell therapy trial didn't open for his age group until he was too sick to participate. In some ways, the extra suffering for what was likely to be uh, not a life-saving treatment was spared, but it was important to Cameron and us to know that without a doubt, we had done everything that we possibly could. Cameron passed away on May 16th, 2020, just about a year from today, in our home surrounded by our family and the care of the Connect Place team. While the ending of our story is tragic and certainly one that our family will never recover from, we promised Cameron that we would continue to make lemonade and that we would carry on what he started and create a legacy of raising awareness and funds so that other kids could fight. As such, we choose to speak when asked and we have donated his extra stem cells, his tumor cells and his blood samples and hope that they will help someone else in the future. We are forever grateful that blood products gave us that extra time and let us say yes to fighting. And we certainly want to thank each of you for the roles that you play in the blood system. Cameron, we could give each of you a hug if he were here to do so. So I'd be more than happy to take any questions that you have. Please don't worry about whether it'll be upsetting or too personal. Um, it really is our goal to share. Thank you very much, Sharon, for sharing that story. I'm all teared up already. <laughs> so uh, if anyone has, uh, has questions, please feel free to, to ask them. Dr. Conaway, are you on screen? I think you're on mute, Ed. Oh, that's good, because I would have been choked up a little bit. Thank you so much for that presentation. I really just want to thank you for presenting that story um, as difficult as it was. And, um, and I'm sure that all 122 participants at this meeting will be um, knocking on um, the Oak Street um, blood service, uh, um, community blood services to um, donate blood. Thank you, and I hope so, that would be great. Uh, there's quite a few thank yous in our in the chat box for sharing your story from coming in from folks. Um, um, so it's, it's very powerful. Hi, uh, this is uh, Claire O'Reilly. I'm the transfusion safety nurse at BC Children's and ex-oncology nurse. Um, thank you so much for for sharing your story. Um, I it's it's so amazing to hear how intrigued Cameron was with the whole process of of transfusion, where the blood came from, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I am aware that in the UK, and I'm not sure if it's traveled further than the UK, they have a um, something called Harvey's Gang, where children who require um, chronic transfusion um, get to interact with the laboratory staff at the hospitals. Um, obviously, since COVID-19, um, some of these activities have been curtailed, but um, they're active on, on Twitter. And there's amazing images of children in lab coats getting to go and uh, see what goes on in a lab. And... Um, you know, I, I'm curious to know if Cameron would have been interested in something like that. 
Oh, for certain he would have. Um, we were very blessed that the Oak Street staff and, um, you know, other Canadian Blood Services personnel definitely popped over a few times to the hospital to say hi and see Cameron. Um, and, and he certainly had lots of questions for them. Um, one of the things we had hoped to do when he got well enough, which unfortunately didn't happen, was to go to the Oak Street um, location to be able to tour the lab there. So I certainly think he and many other kids would be very interested in a program like you described. Mm. I know also from, I worked in the AFRESIS clinic, blood donation clinic uh, back in Ireland. And I know that um, donors were always so interested in, in hearing stories and knowing um, what happened with their, their blood. And even when I worked at NETCAT out at UBC for the research donors, it was always fascinating to be able to say to somebody, you know, you're donating for research, but I know how this impacts practice. So I think it is important that we um, have these stories go back and forth so that donors um, have that awareness of what happens after, you know, they make their donation, which is absolutely amazing. It's a donation. So, so yeah, thank you so much for sharing your story. You're very welcome. And I couldn't agree more. I think it was very impactful to visit the Oak Street Center and have Cameron be able to, you know, thank each one and give them a little button that said, you are my hero. And, um, you know, I don't know that there was a dry high left in the house. It really was impactful for them to see that. Thank you. Okay, thank, thanks so much, Sharon. You're, you're welcome to stay for the rest of the symposium and, and uh, you know, feel free to, to hang around. So but thank th you. thanks so much for that. Greatly appreciated.